My name is Harold Church Scott Roth, and I'll be your host today here at the Center for the Economics of the Internet at the Hudson Institute. Today, we have the great honor of having with us Commissioner Brendan Carr of the Federal Communications Commission. Commissioner Carr's bio is available at the FCC website. He has a distinguished career as a commissioner uh, where he has been uh, a very strong an outspoken advocate for free market principles at the FCC and for the commission following the law. Commissioner Carr, welcome to the Center for the Economics of the Internet. Uh, well, Commissioner, thanks for having me and uh, thanks for your long public service, uh, both at the FCC and now um, advocating here some really great ideas. I think that the FCC has long benefited from your run at the commission and the rigorous analytical and uh, economic approach that you take. So. Um, you left a really strong, uh, important legacy at the FCC. So uh, thanks for everything that you're doing. Well, thank you for those very kind comments, Commissioner. Uh, there are so many topics uh, in which you have uh, uh, staked out some, some wonderful positions. And uh, I'm, I'm just hopefully, hopeful we can get to even <laughs> a few of them today. I'd like to start with uh, uh, what I might characterize as a, a, a great experiment, uh, which is uh, congressional direct spending on uh, broadband deployment. And we've seen this now in a couple of major bills that have passed Congress in the past uh, couple of years. Uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, congressional direct spending on broadband that, uh, that we're seeing right now? Yeah, well, one of the last great uh, experiments with a significant influx of congressional dollars on broadband happened uh, after the 2008-2009 uh, recession. Uh, there was an injection of about $7 billion from ARRA, which went to uh, Commerce Department, NTIA. And long story short, there was a lot of GAO reports. There was a lot of congressional hearings. There was a lot of pounding on the table, vows of never again because we just saw tremendous waste, fraud, and abuse in that program. Uh, and yet here we are again. Uh, we've spent multiples or have appropriated multiples of that $7 billion, uh, $40 billion alone in one program that's going back to uh, the Commerce Department. So it's been a mixed bag. I don't know that you know, the source of funding itself um, is necessarily determinative of success or failure, but the lack of having a coordinated broadband strategy that goes with these significant expenditures of funding is a problem in the past, and it's a, it's going to be a problem right now. And it's it's uh, it's really a shame to see. I mean, by my count, we have something like eight hundred billion dollars that have been allocated across various agencies in the last two years or so, enough to close the digital divide probably ten times over. And so maybe for the first time in in our memory, we have enough money at the federal level. To end the digital divide. And that only puts in spotlight the policies. And, and frankly, you know, as we can get into, um, I'm, I'm very concerned with some of the policies and the lack of uh, guardrails on all of this spending. I mean, look, and I'll, I'll stop my filibuster here, but, you know, DC has this great tendency of cutting a big check, uh, raising the mission accomplished flag and moving on. And that's not how it works in the real world. The hard part was allocating billions of dollars for broadband, fine. The really hard part is making sure that money goes into the ground in an effective way. Um, and, and I'm very concerned about where we're heading on that front. Well, tell us a bit about those concerns. Uh, where do you see, uh, NTI has a, is it a $42.5 billion fund? Uh, th these are staggering numbers, uh, as, as you point out. Uh, where do you see this money going? Yeah, it, it, it's a big challenge. And, you know, you also have to understand sort of the environment that we're in right now, this just massively inflationary environment. I was just out in South, um, South Dakota doing a broadband roundtable with Senator Thune, and we were hearing from internet providers that say they're seeing 20 to 30 percent higher costs today than they were a short while ago. That's from inflation. That's from higher fuel costs. It's from workforce shortages. Uh, it's from supply chain challenges. And when you have a stressed system like that already, and then you pour $40 billion on top of it in an uncoordinated way, um, we're really heading for some, some danger territory here, probably starting the next year 
when that 40 billion works its way into the marketplace. So that's a challenge. The, the big problem is a lack of a, a coordinated strategy. GAO just recently came up with a report that said that the administration has no national broadband strategy coordinating all of the spending, even though according to GAO, there's 15 different agencies right now where this money is spread across 133 different programs. Um, I mean, this is just, you know, putting the cart before the horse when you get all this money and no plan. I mean, the way I, I have sort of been describing it is imagine if you go and, you know, turn the spigot on full blast in front of your house and then walk away from the hose and it just starts, you know, spitting water everywhere. Taxpayers are going to get soaked. Um, there's still some time left to correct this, but it's, it's disturbing that we're just putting all this money out there without coordinating. I'm fine with spending money for broadband. That's our, our charter, our job at the FCC to some extent, uh, according to the Communications Act. But you have to have a game plan in place on the front end. And that's that's missing right now. Well, tell us a bit about this. So uh, it's not all going to get coordinated by NTIA, I take it, even though they have the lion's share of the money. Tell us about some of the other agencies that have uh, significant amounts of funds to hand out as well. You know, I wrote a letter over a year ago now to each of the major agencies that have significant broadband funding. So it's Department of Agriculture, Commerce, um, Treasury, uh, Education. All of these agencies have significant chunks of money that could be used on broadly infrastructure, but within that, um, internet infrastructure. So again, we've got the money to end the digital divide. Um, if we get the policies right. And I'm concerned about the policies. We mentioned briefly commerce, uh, their $40 billion. They just came out with their guardrails or guidance for spending the money. Um, and I'm really worried about it. I mean, first and foremost, I think we're lining up to do a significant amount of overbuilding, which again, when you already have stressed workforces, uh, where you don't have the crews that you need, where you got supply chain sh shortages, you know, building on top of other building that is going on isn't just bad policy because you're omitting the areas that have zero megabits per second, but you're exacerbating all those supply chain and other challenges. There's some pressure towards rate regulation in what commerce is doing. They basically have tried to peg rates at a, a low income, a middle income level, and then also are, are factoring price uh, at the high end. But one of the biggest challenges with the commerce is they essentially have a technology preference, a, a very strong one for fiber. And you can have a debate about whether to have a fiber preference, whether not to, but there's a threshold matter, which is that the, the Senate negotiators that were working on that bipartisan deal specifically negotiated away from a fiber technology preference and specifically said, this legislation has no preference for technology or providers. And nonetheless, uh, Commerce went ahead and put a very, very heavy thumb on the scale for fiber. Um, and even if you believe in fiber preferences, which, which frankly I do, I, I have voted for fiber preferences when we've had the freedom to do it at the FCC. I, I'd insist on doing it again, but the particular type of fiber preference they put in was just way too heavy thumb. And some people say, well, what's the big deal? Fiber is awesome. I said, yeah, fiber is awesome. I spent a lot of time with crews trenching fiber. I've spliced a lot of fiber uh, when I got out of DC, but there's also a time component, which is to say, if you want everyone to have fiber, what you're saying is you have to wait on the wrong side of the digital divide for years. because That's how long it can take to build fiber in some of these remote areas, as opposed to getting a fixed wireless or a satellite connection almost overnight. And so we have to be having an adult conversation here, which is, okay, you want fiber long-term. I get it. Your view is it's future-proof. Okay. Um, but what do we do this year, next year, the year after, and just telling people, well, wait, something really, really good is going to get delivered to you in the future. That doesn't help them educate their kids today, work remotely today, access telehealth today. So I hope states can correct that a little bit, but it's, it's not clear yet how much freedom commerce is going to give them to balance you know, the speed of bridging the digital divide versus the upside that we all see with fiber. Commissioner, you seem to be saying that NTIA is uh, allocating the funds uh, perhaps in ways that aren't exactly what Congress wrote into the statute. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, I think the guidance that Commerce put out there 
is in, in my view, direct conflict with the plain language and the, the statements of the drafters that negotiated. They said expressly no technology preference. I think it's very clear uh, that there's a fiber technology preference. And again, you can make policy arguments as to why that's a good thing, but as a threshold statutory matter, uh, that's not what Congress set out. And I'll say, look, there's a lot of good stuff about the commerce, so I don't want to go too hard on it. And, and yeah. it, certainly, it certainly could have been a lot worse, but there's you know a couple areas here where I think rather than just staying so targeted on bridging the digital divide, getting unconnected Americans connected, there is an injection of political considerations, you know, maybe at the last minute as commerce was going through this process. You also mentioned overbuilding, uh, which is uh, uh, building more broadband where there already is broadband. Uh, uh, is, is that consistent with the statute? No, not at all. And look, I think there's two areas where you're going to see this. I was um, a couple of weeks ago out in uh, Evansville, Wyoming, small town, maybe two or 3,000 people outside of Casper, Wyoming. Um, very sparse population. It's horse country out there. And I went out there with a crew that was working on a, a, a tower site that was offering fixed wireless. And so right now they have unlicensed fixed wireless service bringing 100 megabits per second, over 20 megabit per second to this very rural, very remote, hard to serve area. People are happy getting 100, you know, over 20 out there. But according to the Commerce uh, Department's definitions, those people are getting zero megabits over zero megabits per second because they don't believe that unlicensed fixed wireless counts. And that just makes no sense. Again, we have actual parts of this country that have zero over zero, and yet we're going to spend money, just, you know, put aside for a second the inflationary impact of that, in this exact area that already has 120, and we're going to do so by telling ourselves it has zero over zero. So that's one problem, unlicensed fixed wireless. Another problem is going to be satellite. You know, so assuming the FCC follows through and approves um, SpaceX's Starlink service, um, which won awards through our RDOF um, phase one application process, if the FCC approves that, they've said that that also doesn't count as high speed internet for purposes of the NOPO. So everywhere that Starlink wins, uh, wins if we approve it, is going to be overbuilt as well. And again, it's just, if we weren't seeing such inflationary problems, you know, maybe you could say, well, reasonable people disagree, but particularly with inflation, particularly with the text of the statute, we cannot be affording to overbuild. And, and that's one way that I think we're, we're not going to deliver on the administration's goal, which is to connect every American. We've got the money to do it. We just had to get the policy right. Commissioner, let, let me just drill down on this point for, for a second. You, you mentioned uh, RDOF, the Rural Development Opportunity Fund that the FCC had an auction on uh, less than two years ago, which was to provide service, broadband service to unserved areas. Uh, so, into, so those areas presumably are going to get broadband service. And is NTI going to be overbuilding the RDOF areas as well? Well, there was a big concern that they were going to broadly overbuild RDOF. And at the end of the day, um, other than those fixed, unlicensed fixed wireless, other than satellite, I'm hopeful that there's not going to be a lot of overbuilding uh, when it comes to the RDOF winter. So to step back, um, then Chairman Pai announced $20 billion uh, rural broadband initiative in two phases. Uh, in the first phase, we had targeted roughly $16 billion dollars for these phase one areas where uh, we thought there was little to no internet connectivity. And we used a reverse auction, which means, you know, people said, okay, I'll provide service to this area for X. And someone said, well, I'll provide service to this area for three quarters of X. We bid down and that resulted in, instead of having a $16 billion spend, according to some estimates, um, we closed that auction for $9 billion. So not only are we connecting households with that RDOF, but we're doing so in an economically efficient way. Now, the most current approach, the, the way that the, this administration is doing it is effectively block grants that aren't going to involve any competition as far as I can see. So I think that's sort of a, a mistake. There was some lessons learned from RDOF. People wanted us to do more vetting of providers on the front end, and I'm certainly open to that. I'm not saying it was perfect, but um, providers are building today pursuant to RDOF. They're getting money today. We were supposed to have an RDOF too, which frankly, we could have gotten that started um, 
by now and, and potentially have dollars hitting the ground through RDOF2 faster than what we're going to see through this administration's um, infrastructure bill. Let me just touch on a couple of other things about the NTIA program. Uh, one is open platforms. Uh, could you tell us a bit about the NTIA programs favoring platforms that uh, will let all providers on and, and whether that's going to create incentives for companies to actually invest? Yeah, I mean, this is part of you know what I view in that bucket of sort of extraneous political considerations that have been added on to the back end of this. So again, you know, overbuilding, I think, is going to be a problem. The rate regulation provisions, or at least those that look like that, are a problem. And we have that third bucket of just political considerations. And yeah, there's everything in there from, you know, preferences for municipal broadband to preferences, as you pointed out, for, um, you know, open access and other things. And again, if you want to have a debate about those things, then let's let's do that. Let's do that at the FCC. Um, let's do that in rulemakings. Um, but where this funding is supposed to be very rifle shot focused on, uh, you know, getting that digital divide closed, it's not clear to me that we should be pursuing those political goals um, through those funding initiatives. You mentioned at the beginning of your comments sort of a lack of coordination across different programs. Uh, has there been coordination between NTIA and the FCC on uh, the, the new NTIA program? I'm sure there's been, you know, some I, that principally would have run obviously out of the, the chairwoman's office. But when you step back, there certainly isn't enough coordination. Again, that's what GAO issued that report um, claiming that there was, you know, a, a, or noting that there was, you know, fragmented um, lack of coordination across all of these agencies. And again, when I wrote um, the four main agencies over a year ago and said, hey, are we coordinated? Are we using the same definitions? Are we using metrics to, to see if we're succeeding or not? Uh, two of the agencies wrote me back. Uh, two of them didn't even bother right back despite, you know, four or five, six follow-up requests. So it, it's not clear to me from my own experience, plus the GAO report, that we are sufficiently coordinated across all of these agencies with dispersed pots of money. Uh, the NTIA program is going to be administered uh, at the local level through the states, uh, will they have a chance to kind of uh, correct some of the mistakes at the federal level or uh, uh, are, are their hands tied in, in how they have to hand out the money? It's going to be close. There's, there's, I'm hoping there's some wiggle room there, but um, definitely the administration put a thumb on the scale. So you can put it in an application, for instance, and say, look, I, I want to bring fixed wireless to this remote community because it can go a lot faster, basically in a weekend in many cases, um, as opposed to four or five years for fiber. And hopefully the administration will defer to that application, but it's not clear. Again, I mean, they basically said you have to have fiber unless there's some extreme showing. So um, I, I guess, one, I'm looking to work, work with the states. Two, I hope that they exercise some discretion to correct um, what I think are some unnecessary preferences. And then three, we're going to have to hope that the administration defers to those state level determination and approves those, what I would view as corrected applications. I've heard some um, kind of political rumblings about whether the direct spending from Congress on, I'll call it this big experiment, if you will, uh, will uh, potentially displace the FCC's internal universal service fund program, uh, which has been in place now for, for over 20 years. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about that, about uh, the FCC's federal universal service fund program and uh, what its future is like, uh, particularly when they're these enormous uh, direct spending from, from Congress. Yeah, there's, there's sort of a ripe debate about that. I mean, going back to the, the 96 Act, you know, we replaced this idea of explicit subsidies, um, you know, or, or, or implicit subsidies with this, with this uh, approach of, of, uh, of what we have now with these, you know, charges that appear on basically end users, traditional telephone 
bills. And, and the upside of that that people always talked about is when you insulate that from the direct appropriation process, it becomes less political, it's more predictable, you're not tied to you know, a government shutdown. And when you look at broadband, which requires you know, multi-year investments, there was a sense that having this housed in the FCC rather than a direct appropriation resulted in a more predictable environment. But what's also clear to me, though, is that the FCC's current method, method, this universal service fund, is absolutely stuck in a death spiral. So, you know, back at the the, the turn of the 2000s, um, when we first started assessing traditional telephone revenues, again, we collect about $9 billion a year through this assessment on end users. Um, That's how we get the universal service fund the base of traditional telephone revenues has been in a steep decline. And as a result, the percentage charge that we add to consumers end user bill uh, is, is moving steadily upwards and we're roughly in the 30% range right now. So I think that's unsustainable in the long term. Um, I've put out some ideas about how we can reform the contribution side of USF. One idea that I've been looking at very closely is to start asking large technology companies to start contributing a fair share. After all, if you look at you know, the streamers, for instance, they are um, consuming an inordinate amount of the bandwidth of these USF supported networks. If you look at digital advertising uh, services as well, Google and Facebook, that's a lot of bandwidth and they generate a lot of value from having a USF supported network. So my view has been that we should start looking at them to contribute a fair share. We could eliminate or largely eliminate the assessment that appears on consumers' uh, telephone bills right now. There's also a view that we should start assessing um, internet service itself. Uh, I think that would be a mistake. I think particularly at a point in time when we're focused on driving down the cost of service and affordability, adding an additional charge to bias, as we call it, broadband internet access service would be a mistake. And so there's sort of a, a bunch of options right now. Do you look to large technology companies? Do you look to bias? Or do you look to a direct appropriation? I think a lot of people are sort of looking at direct appropriation uh, as an alternative to the other two. But for my part, I I, I really think that we should look at large technology companies as a way to um, secure a a stable funding source for USF going forward. Commissioner, you've just uh, raised a whole set of issues about funding of uh, a federal program. Uh, and I think you've laid out a, a, a good menu of options for uh, how this should be approached. Are these decisions that should be made uh, at the commission or uh, are these what might be called major issues uh, uh, as we're seeing in uh, Ohio, the uh, EPA that uh, uh, should be addressed by Congress. Uh, can can Congress delegate those types of decisions to the FCC? And, and maybe it's already done that under Section 254. What, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think there's some of this that we could do on our own, but to start assessing you know, the full suite of big tech services, in my view, it's very clear that we would need um, additional legislation from Congress to do that. So right now there's already some, you know, transport-like, services that large technology companies offer that probably fit within our definition today. So we could start assessing those, but to truly get at the full suite of large technology company services that I think could potentially be assessed, we need Congress to act for that. Uh, We have a report due to Congress, I think this summer on the future of USF. I'm hoping that report includes recommendations along this line. There's some study bills that have been introduced already in Congress and some actual substantive bills as well that would give us the authority uh, to assess big tech for these purposes. Um, And I've been working with various members of Congress on that. But yes, in in short, this would require some new legislation, which is why, you know, I've been talking about it for a year or so now because we can go another year or so under the status quo, but I'm not I'm not sure how, how many more years we can go beyond that. It seems like this issue, this issue isn't entirely new. It's been around for many years, uh, you know, USF contribution reform. And uh, uh, it, it just uh, gets kicked down the road. And, and uh, you're, you're exactly right. It, there is this, it's, I would call it a tax, uh, the 
25, 30%. And, and it's heavily, it's heavily on wireless users. Uh, that's, that's primarily what's left of uh, interstate uh, service. Uh, and it's, it's a hidden tax and it's, uh, uh, it, it's it's a it's not a as you point out it's exactly right it's it's not a sustainable situation. Uh, uh, any thoughts you can share with us on what you're hearing back from Capitol Hill on uh, uh, where members might be leaning or thinking about going? Yeah, there's been some good bipartisan support. Uh, for the concept of looking at large technology companies, everyone from uh, the Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy, uh, in the House, um, to Senator Lujan uh, in the Senate uh, Commerce Committee, um, they've all expressed openness towards looking at large technology companies. So I think that's good. And I think this, this record that hopefully the FC builds uh, towards this report in the summer can, can create some more momentum towards that end. But again, I think you know a lot of people are thinking, well, if we don't get a big legislative change, then let's just flop it over and start charging bias. And to me, I just say, no, I, I, I absolutely think that's a, that's a no non-starter for me. I think some of the companies are fine with it because they say, look, we just need a sustainable amount. So charge my you know, telephone subscribers or charge my broadband subscribers. I'm Switzerland. And I say, that's fine that you're Switzerland, but I'm, but I'm not. You know, I, I think it's a problem to assess bias. And so um, I, I think we've got to build the, the, the coalition now uh, against just, you know, default flopping over to bias. Let's, let's change topics a bit. Uh, you've been uh, uh, shown extraordinary leadership on 5G issues over the years and have been outspoken in uh, supporting the development of 5G. Uh, what's your sense of where the United States is on 5G deployment relative to where some other countries might be? Well, I'm worried. Uh, I, I think that we are starting to hit stall speed when it comes to America's 5G leadership. If you look back to 2015, 16, early 17, um, there was a very real concerted push, particularly by China and some other countries that said, look, the U.S. sees leadership in 4G. The app economy grew. Silicon Valley you know, benefited tremendously from that leadership. Our economy benefited tremendously from that leadership. So China and others wanted to be the global leader in 5G, and we were behind. You know, there was all kinds of reports out there saying that China was going to unleash a 5G tsunami um, and just blow the U.S. and other competitors out of the water. And so we rolled up the sleeves and got to work. We freed up an unprecedented amount of spectrum from low to mid-band uh, to high band. We engaged in five or six very serious infrastructure reforms that helped to accelerate small sales and 5G builds. And the reality was we then leapfrogged our global uh, competitors and secured a leadership spot uh, during the Trump administration. And in this administration, I have not gotten the sense that 5G uh, is the same type of priority. You know, you look at some of the recent debates between the FCC and FAA and DOT on C-band, you know, Politico said that the Biden administration donned down to the jersey of team delay and sided with DOT there. We still don't have full um, power, full deployment of C-band. You look at you know the DOD legato issue, um, which has been kicking around. Um, there's all sorts of evidence that this administration is not leaning in and siding with 5G in these interagency disputes the way that you saw in the last administration. So we did a lot of really good work um, but we sort of hit the point where we're resting on our laurels and that's not a great spot to be in. There's a lot more spectrum that we need to be freeing up. There's a lot more infrastructure reforms that we need to be doing. Again, we're spending money, but we're not making it easier to build. And that's just like, you know, jumping on the gas and the brakes at the same time. Let me give you one more example. When I was out in Casper, Wyoming, I was walking through a, a warehouse, a lay down yard. They had something like 90 antennas just sitting in that warehouse ready to go, but they didn't have the permits from BLM, Bureau of Land Management, to get those built out. And so we really need something that starts at the very top of this administration to say, America leadership in 5G is still a priority. It means jobs. It means competitiveness for China on this new economic platform. 
Um, but we got to get going because it, it certainly appears that we've been resting in our laurels here for a little bit. That, that, that worries me. Uh, sure. Could you expand on that? So Bureau of Land Management, that's under, is that Department of Interior? Uh, that might be right. And so uh, they're not issuing permits for antennas to go up for 5G networks or at least in yeah, Wyoming, been, there's some delay. Uh, well, no, this has been a perennial problem. When you look at building internet infrastructure on federal lands, if you pick a plot of land to build and it's private, um, it's about half as long as if that same plot of land happened to be federal lands. Um, and various pieces of legislation have been passed to try to speed this up, but it's a challenge because it comes down to a local person in a local office and they've got you know their own job to do and their payment structure from an incentive structure is you know BLM issues or Department of Interior issues, um, forestry issues. Um, it's just never been a top priority. And so the further west you go, um, the higher percentage of lands are federal lands. And so there's still a lot of running room left in terms of moving faster on these permit approvals to, to build on federal lands. What can the FCC on its own be doing? You mentioned uh, getting more spectrum out, uh, doing more things to promote 5G. Can you tell us a few things that you think the FCC could or should be doing on, on the 5G front? Well, look, early, early on in this transition from 4G to, to 5G, I, I was given a, a nickname by, I think, Axios of, uh, of the FCC's 5G crusader. I think we yes. need a bit more of a 5G uh, evangelizing, both at the FCC and the administration. I think a lot of people, you know, incorrectly think, well, 5G, I was expecting, you know, the same leap of my smartphone that I saw from 3G to 4G. I thought it was going to be that same leap again on my smartphone from 4G to 5G. And that's, that's not what it is. You know, 5, 4G was a network sort of custom built for high performance, you know, smartphone use cases. That's not what the 5G network is. Your phone's going to be faster. You know, you'll download a movie in, you know, whatever is a couple seconds rather than, you know, 30 seconds or a minute. But that's the least interesting part of 5G. The, the first interesting part is it's sort of not that sexy, but it's in-home broadband. I mean, we're seeing tons and tons of competition for in-home broadband by um, the delivery of 5G services. You've got, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> AR, VR um, applications. And so I, I think we have to start talking more about the upside of 5G um, to help sort of generate the momentum behind the regulatory reforms. And then the regulatory reforms are, to your point, spectrum. We got to get going on lower three, uh, lower three gigahertz. Um, you know, we're going to complete our 2.5 auction here soon, hopefully. There's a number of other spectrum bands that I've identified, VLP, very low power and six gigahertz, which can be used to power a lot of those AR, VR applications. So it's a combination of talking about it again um, and, and then following that up with infrastructure reforms and with, uh, you know, more spectrum. So I think those are some of the things that we need to do. And frankly, you know, I think the administration needs to do that as well. You just don't hear as much about 5G as you did during the last administration. There was a big broadband event at the White House a couple of weeks ago now, but it focused principally on, you know, fixed wireline providers, which is great. But, you know, it, it didn't emphasize the role that, that 5G is playing. And stepping back, I mean, this is a huge um, competition point with China still. If you look at the standard setting process, you know, for 5G, China has intentionally staked this out and said that, you know, controlling the standard setting process is how they're going to sort of take their domestic um, industries and project it uh, around the globe. They've talked about using this as part of, you know, um, you know, nefarious actions, whether they're um, a lot of their, their, their standards are dual use military civilians. So there's still a lot here with our global competitiveness to China that depends on America continue to lead the way on 5G. And it just seems like that baton is starting to get dropped. What is your sense in other parts of the world uh, about how the rivalry, if you will, between the United States and China on 5G is playing out? Uh, what is your sense of, of how that is, is, is working? Well, we made some great strides. You know, we had that clean networks initiative um, that Pompeo and State Department launched. And when we first started that approach, 
which was looking at getting insecure Huawei, ZTE, and other gear out of not just our networks, but global networks. I think a lot of um, administrations abroad were skeptical, but through the discussions that took place pursuant to that, I think a lot of people sort of saw the light with some of the misinformation coming out of communist China around COVID-19. A lot of our allies abroad came to the U.S. position um, of taking a harder line when it comes to Huawei, ZTE. So I think that's a good thing, Europe in particular. Uh, Africa's a challenge. Um, I've spent uh, a little bit of time there, and the Huawei ZTE gear is very, very deeply embedded in those uh, networks. I was in Kenya, a very, very small remote town called Nanuki, which is about two or three hours outside uh, of Nairobi, and there were you know massive billboards advertising Huawei all the way out there. So Africa's going to be tough. South America's going to be tough. But I do think we made some good strides in particular uh, in Europe. You mentioned China, and one of the big issues uh, regarding China right now is uh, supply chain issues and, and getting uh, you know, chips for cars, chips for cell phones, uh, getting all types of products. Globally, uh, supply chains have been disrupted by COVID and other factors. Uh, how are you seeing that play out in the uh, communication sector right now? Yeah, it's, it's a microcosm for the, the broader supply chain crisis. You know, I was out at um, the Port of Long Beach, Port of Los Angeles a few months back, so sort of saw firsthand, obviously, all the ships backed up and then all the other knock-on challenges. I mean, we see the supply chain crisis at the, the, the backup of ships um, at the port, but obviously, it, it continues throughout the broader supply chain ecosystem. When I spend time with crews, they're having shortages, everything from pickup trucks that they need to do their jobs to, you know, pedestals that they need, you know, for, um, for these bills. Anything that requires a chipset, to your point, um, has been a challenge. And some of the bigger providers are doing okay, but the, the medium and small ones are seeing just really long lead times for a lot of this. And again, there doesn't seem to be, you know, a coordinated plan for this. I mean, we need to be dealing with not just spending money, but we need, you know, a supply chain plan. We need um, a permitting acceleration plan. We need a workforce plan. You know, there's a, a, a contractor recently that said that, you know, they go to church every Sunday and they pray that their um, crews are going to show up that Monday. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they've been hired off by a bigger provider with, with more money. So we just don't have that comprehensive game plan. And I think the worst is yet to come because these funds have yet to hit the ground. When they do, some good things are going to happen. Some bills are going to be happening but it's also going to exacerbate a lot of these crunches that we're seeing. The FCC has a, a couple of NOIs out on uh, national security issues uh, as well as NPRMs on them. What, what should the FCC be doing on national security and supply chain issues? Well, the most important thing that we should do in the near term is to complete our Secure Equipment Act proceeding. So if you remember, when we took these actions on Huawei and ZTE, what we really did was prohibited USF funding from being used to purchase that year. But there was a loophole, which is to say, if you used private dollars, you could purchase the exact same gear and put it in the exact same point in your network. Now, we don't think there was a high percentage of that going on. We think almost all that was probably... Um, USF dollar purchases, but there were some. And if you look at the FCC's equipment authorization uh, process, you'll see a ton of hits for Huawei and ZTE gear that we're continuing to review and approve. And so um, one option in our Secure Equipment Act proceeding would be for the FCC to determine that if you're on our covered list, um, if you're on that USF no funding list, then that also translates into our equipment authorization regime, which means that your devices cannot be approved for use in the US. And as you know, there's no electronic device that can be used in the US without FCC approval. So I think completing that Secure Equipment Act proceeding would be um, job one. And then we got to continue our efforts more broadly. I've said that we should publish a list of every single entity um, that is either licensed by the FCC or has equipment approved by the FCCs with sufficient ties uh, to the communist regime in China. And I think we need to take a close look at DJI. This is the drone manufacturer based in uh, uh, Shenzhen, China. 
Um, there's a lot of concerns that I have there, and I, and I think we need the national security agencies to weigh in with their definitive view on the threats posed by DJI. So we've made some good progress, and some of it is continuing, but I think we need to go even further when it comes to uh, the threat from communist China. Let's switch gears a bit and talk about privacy. Uh, it, at some point in the next couple of years, it's possible that the FCC may uh, once again, impose network neutrality rules. Uh, uh, and if they do it under Title II, there's a question, at least in the minds of many, including myself, about whether the Federal Trade Commission, which has been very active on privacy, would have any authority on uh, reviewing uh, broadband providers if they're treated as common carriers. What is the FCC doing on privacy now? And, and what do you see as the future relationship on privacy policy between the FCC and the Federal Trade Commission? Yeah, well, there's, for, for the people out there that are still focused on, you know, myopically um, utility style regulation just of the ISP, and they're not thinking more broadly about the entire internet ecosystem. I think that's concerning because I think if you look at the last couple of years, you look at the discrimination, the bias, uh, the blocking of URLs, the places that that's taking place is not at the ISP layer. And so my view is I'm open to taking a look um, sort of across the entire stack of the internet system and what rules of the road do we need. But to your point, there's a lot of people that say, well, let's just rerun the 2014, 2015 playbook you know, solely look at the ISP. There's a number of reasons why, you know, rerunning the 2014 playbook um, might not work as well as those advocates think uh, today as it did then. There's a couple of reasons for it. One is privacy, as you pointed out, which I'll get to. But, um, you know, the other obviously is, you know, the evolution and thinking with the courts, as you noted earlier, on major question doctrines and Chevron could be problematic for the FCC in a, in a Title II case. But your point about privacy, so there's still this common carrier rule, which means if you are a common carrier, um, you're carved out of the FTC's jurisdiction. So right now, we have basically a level playing field for ISPs and all technology companies who are governed by the FTC's um, privacy regime. That's the nation's premier consumer watchdog. And if we at the FCC were to reclassify the internet under Title II, that strips the FTC of its jurisdiction um, over ISPs, including privacy. And unlike 2014, we could not backfill with FCC um, privacy rules because Congress passed this um, CRA, Congressional Review Act, uh, back in 2017, and we are barred from putting those rules or substantially similar back. So if we were to reclassify internet, you would leave ISPs with no federal law uh, governing or regulating their privacy practices. And that's either a problem as a policy perspective, um, depending on your view, but it's also a problem from an APA perspective in a review of any FCC decision because it, you know, arguably at least is arbitrary to um, create an unfillable donut hole when it comes to privacy. So I've yet to hear a really strong argument as to how reclassifying the internet under Title II in light of the privacy CRA either makes policy sense or, um, you know, doesn't suffer from weakness from an APA appeal perspective. What, what, if anything, should the FCC be doing on privacy? Well, right now, um, you know, the, the, the privacy is, is governed by that sort of level playing field FTC approach. And I think that's, that's the right way uh, for it to be done. I, and so for the time being, there's nothing for the FCC to do because there's no problem with respect to a lack of jurisdiction. I know Congress is also looking at this issue. So I think we should be um, watching how those discussions go. I know there was, was an attempt to do a four corners and then it somehow shrunk to three corners. And we'll see if it goes back to, to four corners again uh, with members of uh, House Commerce and Senate Commerce um, engaged in some you know ongoing active discussions about that. Uh, is somewhat related to privacy is uh or indirectly, is, is Section 230. And you've been uh, one of the most uh, articulate <laughs> people on Section 230. And, I'll, and I'll your, take it. I'll take it. <laughs> and and uh, views on what uh, the FCC should be doing under Section 230. Uh, for our audience, can you 
Can you share with them your thoughts about Section 230 and what the FCC should be doing? Well, it was really it was really nice, you know, two years ago, I guess now when I was talking about 230, because there were so few people uh, doing it. It got a lot of attention. Now everybody has a 230 bill. Everyone has a, a take on 230. And in some way, I, I think that's a really good thing. I think it shows how much has changed uh, in the last two years with respect to particularly conservatives thinking about large technology companies. So, you know, I have a lot of views, but 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 in a nutshell, here's how I look at 230. There's many par- parts of 230, but for this discussion, I'm going to break it into two parts. So 230C1, in, in my view, basically says if you leave someone else's speech up on your website, you're not liable for it. If there's any liability that attaches with it, it's the speakers. I think that's great. That's a, a pro-speech provision that results in people leaving speech up. I think one of the main challenges comes with 230C2, which in my view, and some people dispute this, courts have read as basically giving um, entities carte blanche to remove speech, to censor, and to do so not pursuant to the scope of their First Amendment right to remove speech, with, which people always have, but pursuant to these statutory right of removal. I think that's become the challenge. And so in my view, I think the FCC should have stepped up um, and brought some clarity to the terms in Section 230. After all, it's in the Communications Act. Um, but but short of that, or maybe beyond that, I think Congress should now step in and to some extent state legislatures um, in looking at limiting that statutory right of removal. And then beyond that, I think we should adopt some other reforms that go beyond 230. I think transparency, it's a total black box right now when it comes to big tech. I think accountability so that if you, know, if you have an account removed or, um, or yeah, account removed, for reasons that you don't think actually line up with a tweet that you sent or, or a Facebook post, you should have an ability to uh, appeal that. I think that we need some type of core non-discrimination. It could be as little as treating like cases alike. If you don't like this type of speech from the right, then you should also you know, um, not allow that type of speech from the left and, and, and vice versa. Um, plus user empowerment. At the end of the day, let's let people make their own content moderation decisions. That's part of what 230 was about was creating an incentive for these websites to give people tools through their own moderation. And right now it's been centralized by these companies. So the way I describe it is if you want Fox News to filter your feed, then get a Fox News plugin. If you want MSNBC to filter it for you, get that plugin. If you want Twitter to do it the way they're doing it, great. Click that button. But let's give people more choice about that content moderation. So those are just some of the ideas that I think we need. But look, I also think it goes beyond just you know social media. I, I'm concerned about what we're seeing in the uh, the digital currency and banking space. I'm concerned about some of the practices in um, the, the the email system in terms of at least reports of, of bias and discrimination there. Same with text messaging. So I do think you need to look at this entire internet ecosystem and given its importance, um, think about some, you know, common sense uh, guardrails against discrimination. And I think we can do that consistent with the First Amendment. You know, we look at some of the cases like Turner and the cable context, not necessarily, you know, a perfect analogy, but I think it's an analogy where, you know, we limited um, the right of a cable channel to pick and choose what channels to carry in a way that the Supreme Court said survived First Amendment scrutiny. And so I think, you know, that's a type of precedent, you know, extended perhaps to the social media context, to the internet ecosystem context, um, where I think we need to go. But, you know, Reasonable people very strongly disagree uh, with my views on that, and that's okay. That's that's why this is sort of a an evolving, active discussion. Commissioner, you you mentioned uh, the financial sector. Uh, could you uh, expand on that uh, bias and content on in the financial sector? Yeah, I think there's a concern. You know, when 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 so much of this you know payment processing is moving. Uh, digital that you could have, you know, Square or Venmo or, uh, you know, other companies like that, where you can take, um, you know, the blocked list from Twitter and you could, you know, have that uh, onto the financial services platform to get debanked, uh, not just, you know, removed from Twitter. Getting off of Twitter is, you know, w- one level of punishment. It'll go, maybe at the end of the day, it's, it's a blessing to be removed from Twitter, not, not a punishment. So maybe you don't have standing to challenge that. I guess, I right. guess that depends on your perspective. But yeah, I think when you see, you know, uh, fundraising, you know, sort of sort of uh, websites, um, digital payment processing, um, credit card processing, I, I'm concerned about, you know, discrimination becoming deeply embedded there over time. Are any of these areas ones that the FCC 
candidates should be looking at or are these kind of outside of the FCC's jurisdiction, do you think? Yeah, a lot of that is pretty far beyond the FCC's jurisdiction. I think 230 isn't, you know, 230, again, is in the Communications Act, um, you know, Supreme Court precedent. Um, I think even City of Arlington goes to the point that we can interpret pr- provisions of the act. So I think we can do that. I think we still should do that. In fact, as far as I can tell, the um, the Trump era Commerce Department petition asking us to interpret Section 230 is, is still pending, as best I can tell, at the FCC. So I'm happy to take that up and work with my colleagues on that. But uh, a lot of that other stuff that I talked about is going to require um, acts of Congress, not not agencies. And you can do it in a way that doesn't leave a lot of gaps to fill. If people say, well, I don't want to trust a Democrat you know, FTC, or I don't want to trust a Republican FTC. Well, there, there's a way that Congress can legislate that doesn't require an agency to fill in the gaps, just be specific about what you want and make it the law. And so I think a lot of this should take place uh, in the House and the Senate. And there's some good bills. Senator Wicker has this pro-speech act um, that I think is really good. Um, Kathy Morris Rogers, Jim Jordan, Jim Banks, um, Kevin McCarthy in the House, they've got some good bills as well. And there's some bipartisan transparency bills too. Yeah, I don't follow this as closely as I should, but I, as I understand it, there were uh, a couple of states that had 230-like bills, if you will, uh, that got reviewed by the courts, and there's sort of as a circuit split. Uh, and if, if my memory were better, I could tell you exactly what it was. I, do you see this as an issue that gets teed up for the Supreme Court, uh, uh, or is this something that's just going to fester and come back to the FCC? I do think ultimately we're going to get a Supreme Court case on the merits, not just looking at, you know, PI uh, uh, initial relief cases like we've seen so far. Um, I think it's important. I think, you know, when you look at the various compelled speech cases that are out there, um, the medium makes a big difference for the level of review. Again, the way I think about it, if you're a newspaper, Miami Herald, Tornillo, you have approaching an absolute First Amendment right that cannot be uh, infringed in terms of deciding what you know editorials to carry. But if you look at the other end of the spectrum, if what you're doing is more, in my in my argument, conduit like, if in the main you're carrying other people's speech, not the speech of your you know articles editors that that you've hired, um, then I think there's room there consistent with the First Amendment to put some guardrails in place. Again, that's where I think you know Turner is potentially an example of that. Again, the D.C. Circuit net neutrality decision from was it 2016, basically said to a, to a the compelled speech well, argument against net neutrality, mm-hmm. we don't even think this is a speech issue because in the main, you're carrying other people's speech. So I think um, there ultimately should be a Supreme Court case that comes out that looks at regulation, regulating the right to exclude or regulating content moderation in the context of social media in the features of that medium that are, at least in my view, arguably um, different from a constitutional perspective than, a, than the newspaper cases and other ones that we've seen. Commissioner, I could go on all day uh, asking questions. I'm thoroughly enjoying this, but I want to <laughs> respect your time. I'm going to ask just one more question or set of questions, and that has to do with what I think uh, a, a lot of Americans, maybe most Americans, are worried about these days, which is inflation. Uh, you know, we're seeing it at the gas pump. We're seeing it at the grocery store. We're seeing it everywhere. Prices going up very rapidly in the past few months. Uh, is this something you're hearing about at the FCC or consumers concerned about rising communications prices? And you raised something earlier in our discussion, which I have not actually heard much about, which is the potential inflationary effect of pumping tens and tens of billions of dollars into uh, the communication sector, uh, instead of lowering prices, it may actually have the unintended effect of raising prices. Uh, can you elaborate on these? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really concerned about inflation in the telecom sector. I think it's, it's a microcosm for what we're seeing. You know, I, as I mentioned, I've been talking to internet providers and, and they're seeing 20 to 30% increase in costs already, you know, and they talk about it from inflation and, you know, fuel price increases. um, And that's before we have $42 billion that have actually made its way into the market. Um, And so when you're seeing inflation right now in the broadband sector, and then we're, you know, primed to put 42 billion in top on top of it, and not just 42 billion, but potentially 42 billion in an uncoordinated way, um, that that's going to be a problem. And so I do think 
that the FCC should start to take seriously inflation. I think there's actually some policies we can do that would be deflationary in effect, for instance, permitting. Um, we can look at a lot of the small cell permitting reforms we did, which drove costs down and apply those on the fixed wireline side. I think that would help take some of the costs out of the system. Um, and, and so there's other steps that we could do like that um, that I think could, could help minimize some of the inflationary pressures that are about to hit the broadband builders. Commissioner, thank you for your insightful and thoughtful comments. Uh, and uh, we look forward to having you back here at Datsun Institute soon. Hopefully next time in person. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you here. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to speaking with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks.